Hello, this is Russ Walden with Father's Heart Ministry. Welcome to the Morning Light Daily Bible Study. Today we're studying Exodus 27, the brazen altar in the Tabernacle of Moses. After establishing the construction and dimensions of the Tabernacle in the previous chapter, Moses is told how to have the brazen altar constructed. Now, if you remember, this is the second altar that Moses constructed. It wasn't the first. The first altar was in Exodus 24, where the actual old covenant was executed at the base of Sinai, where God called the 70 elders together to eat and drink covenantally around a table where Moses put an altar with 12 pillars representing the 12 tribes. But this altar is erected on the basis of the covenantal altar that the people already agreed to do everything that God had said. So this altar is made of brass, and it represents man coming before God to accept his righteous judgments. This is Exodus 27. It has 21 verses, and we'll read them together. Verse chapter 27, and you will make an altar of shittim wood or acacia wood, five cubits long and five cubits broad, and the altar shall be four square, and the height thereof shall be three cubits. And you will make the horns of it, so it had horns upon the four corners thereof, his horns shall be of the same, and you will overlay it with brass. And you will make his pans to receive his ashes and his shovels and his basins and his flesh hooks and his fire pans, all the vessels thereof you shall make of brass. And because brass represents judgment and the outer court represents God dealing with man according to his judgment in Christ, the sacrifice of Christ, the judgment of God for us so that we can then proceed to enter into the holy place and the holy of holies where everything is overlaid with gold, which speaks of divine nature. So he says, you will, verse 4, you will make a grate for, the, for it, a network of brass, and upon the net you will make four brazen rings in the four corners thereof, and you will put it under the compass of the altar, underneath the altar, that the net may even be to the midst of the altar. And you will make staves for the altar of shittim wood, and overlay them with brass. And the staves shall put in, be put into the rings and the staves shall be upon the two sides of the altar to bear it. So again, everything is mobile. Uh, it shall be hollow, verse 8, the hollow with boards shall you make it as it was showed you in the mount, so they shall make it. And you will make the cord of the tabernacle for the south side southward. There shall be hangings of fine twine linen and of a hundred cubits long for one side. And twenty pillars thereof, and their twenty sockets shall be of brass, the hooks and the pillars and the fillets be of silver. And likewise for the north side of the link there shall be hangings of a hundred cubits long, and twenty pillars and their twenty sockets of brass, and the hooks of the pillars of their fillets of silver. When you see brass, think judgment. When you see silver, think of redemption. In judgment, God is showing mercy to bring redemption through Christ Jesus. And for the breadth of the court, on the west side shall be hangings of 50 cubits, their pillars 10 and their sockets 10, and the breadth of the court on the east side eastward shall be 50 cubits. And so, so it's rectangular, the outer court. The hangings of one side of the gate shall be 15 cubits, and their pillars 3, then their sockets 3. And on the other side shall be hangings 15 cubits, their pillars 3, and their sockets 3. And for the gate of the court, there shall be a hanging of 20 cubits of blue, represents prayer, purple, represents royalty, scarlet, represents the blood of Christ, and fine twine linen brought with needlework, and their pillars shall be four, represents the four gospels, and their sockets four. All the pillars round, all, and for the gate, where am I? All the, verse 17, and all the pillars round about, the court shall be filleted with silver, and their hooks shall be of silver. We're connected to all of these things. You see, silver was used to connect. It's how we connect with God through redemption. The length of the court shall be a hundred cubits, and the breadth fifty everywhere, and the height five represents grace. Fifty represents 
uh, Jubilee, and all the vessels of the tabernacle, verse 19, and all the service thereof, and all the pins thereof, and all the pins of the court shall be of brass, and you shall command the children of Israel that they bring pure olive oil beaten for the light to cause the lamp to burn always in the tabernacle of the congregation without the veil, which was before the testimony. Aaron and his sons shall order it from evening to morning before the Lord, and it shall be a statute forever in their generations on behalf of the children of Israel. So all of that is capped off with the preparation of the anointing oil. The oil represents the anointing of the Holy Ghost. So the brazen altar is where all sacrifices were made in the tabernacle. It was the primary structure of the outer court. It was to be wood overlaid with brass, which speaks of man, the wood, accepting God's judgments. This is the first point where an Israelite accompanied by a priest could approach unto God once they entered through the outer tabernacle door. The door represents Christ himself. Now remember that being wood overlaid with brass, that acacia wood represents human nature. Once a person addressed himself to God at this altar of brass, then they couldn't go forward at this point, but they could gain benefit from the altar in the holy place overlaid with gold. So we accept his judgments that we might receive his nature. The judgments must be addressed first. That's why he is not just Savior, he is Lord. We accept his lordship at the brazen altar, and we receive salvation as we move forward. The bread, which represents healing on the table of showbread, our prayers being answered, the altar of incense, light to walk this Christian life, the lampstand in the holy place that lay beyond. But we have to do business with God at this brazen altar first. So this tells us that the first priority in coming to Christ is to accept the total and complete judgment of sin within ourselves in coming before a holy God. You can't circumvent this aspect of God's nature without denying yourself what lies beyond the, the fruits of his mercy, the merits of his mercy. So we are in our humanity to be also as the sacrifice on the brazen altar. We come uh, Romans 12, 1 and 2, uh, where Paul said, I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies. We've accepted the sacrifice of Christ. We're responding in turn, presenting our bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is our reasonable service. And we're not laying, yes, we're not sacrificing ourselves to his blessing. We're sacrificing ourselves to his judgment because this altar is an altar of brass. Not being conformed to this world. So again, we're accepting his judgments but being transformed by the renewing. Where does the renewal take place? Moving on beyond the brazen altar into the holy place where we may prove that which is good, the outer court, acceptable, the inner court, and perfect, the holy of holies. Now this altar was five cubits by five cubits. Five is the number of grace. So we are offering up, not according to a religious legalism, but according to the gospel of God's unconditional love. The height of the altar is three cubits. Three is a number of completion in the scriptures. It speaks to us of the fact that God asks for nothing more than what we are capable of giving him in our humanity. He does not require beyond that which is actually possible in our human nature. And he replies with a supply of that which would otherwise be impossible. And the result is a life lived in the kingdom. Now, there are four horns on the altar. Verse 2 tells us horns represent power. And they also represent that which announces a message or a call to war or celebration. The four horns speak to us of the four gospels that comprise the core message of the good news of Jesus Christ. Now, it's interesting that... Uh, Different times throughout the history of the Old Testament, the king would condemn somebody and they would run into this altar, whether it was in the tabernacle or in the temple, and would lay hold on the horns of the altar and uh, basically claiming sanctuary. And we have the thing, lay hold on the horns of the altar. But every time an offender did that, 
In other words, they were saying, don't punish me for what I know I'm guilty of. Uh, the soldiers would nonetheless come in several times in the Old Testament, would kill them anyway. This is not a place where you go. It represents the judgments of God. It's not a place where you go to have a little Jesus and connect with what Jesus did for you and then go on getting away with what you're guilty of. No, it's a place to come to the death of self and to offer, not only to receive what is offered up of Jesus in our behalf, but to be a sacrifice offered up as well, according to Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. The altar, again, is overlaid with brass. Brass is judgment. In other words, the basis of judgment in God's economy is sacrifice and not law. <laughs> we accept, see, we cannot walk according to the law unless we receive the judgment at the brazen altar, access the light of the candlestick, uh, commit ourselves to, re to offer up the incense of our prayer, get the healing on the children's bread, the show bread, then we could go on into the Holy of Holies where there the tablets are. You can't keep the law until we go this full route. But we start off by offering ourselves up in sacrifice to the Lord. And we offer ourselves up to him. We accept the sacrifice of Christ responding accordingly, thereby being judged as having our sins washed away and the efficacy of the sacrifice of Christ, making up the difference between our willingness and our capacity to obey, which is nil until the Spirit indwells us. Verse 7 tells us that the, the altar, as with other articles had rings and staves. It was to be mobile like everything else. As living sacrifices, God wants you to be flexible, changeable, shiftable, easily moved. The boards of this altar overlaid with brass were hollow. Speaking of the fact that as living sacrifices, we don't come before God full, but rather empty of ourselves with no other agenda than his will for our lives. Verse 8. The brazen altar was surrounded by tent walls of blue, purple, and scarlet. Verses 9 through 16 tells us blue speaks as of prayer. When you looked at the tabernacle, you saw the color blue. And that's why Jesus growing up learned these things. And he understood that his father's house would be called a house of prayer because the blue pigment was derived from a shellfish or a mussel whereby it was used for pigmentation, but also for incense. And thus, blue speaks to us of prayer. Purple speaks to us of royalty and authority. Scarlet of entitlement and the substitutionary sacrifice by the blood of Christ on our behalf. And again, remember that the tent here where the brazen altar was, that's just in the outer court. And when the sun went down in the outer court, that was outer darkness. You don't want to get stuck there. You need to grow on in God. Uh, the outer court was lit only by the sun. When the sun went down, the darkness in the outer court was referred to as outer darkness, where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. You got to go past the 30-fold salvation realm to something deeper in God. In verses 17 through 18, the dimensions of the outer court are again referenced as they are in the previous chapter, calculated as in the outer court, 4,000 square cubits represents the number of years from Adam to Christ. The inner court was 2,000 cubits, denoting the time of Christ to the conclusion of the 6,000 years of human history, which is right about where we are now. The Holy of Holies, after that, denotes uh, 1,000 square cubits, which speaks of the 1,000-year millennial reign of Christ that comes at the end of the sixth millennia, which is right where we're at in sacred history. The outer court. The inner court, the Holy of Holies, also speaks to us of what Jesus referred to as the 30-fold, the 60-fold, and the 100-fold dimensions of walking with God. In the outer court, that's just being a 30-fold believer. All you got is the message of salvation. You accept Jesus as your sacrifice on the brazen altar of his judgment, never going any further. That's a 30-fold Christian. Some are 60-fold. Uh, they're able to go on. They believe healing is for today at the table of showbread. They receive lampstand illumination and anointing. Uh, they understand the incense of prayer, rabasata, and the fullness of the Spirit. But that's the Pentecostal realm. That's 60 fold. You got to go on beyond that to the hundredfold in the Shekinah glory of God in the Holy of Holies that we can only dimly speak about now because there's been very few that have entered into that realm. 
The lampstand was fueled by oil, olive oil, that was obtained by being beaten and pressed, verses 20 and 21 tells us. Acts 14, 22 says we enter the kingdom through much tribulation or pressure because we're coming into that which was beaten and pressed to be made available to us. Many times the pressure in our lives is not the enemy. We're simply going through the olive press of God preparing to ignite us to be light in the Lord. Aaron and his sons were to take the oil to keep the lampstand burning, the burning church. The lampstand represents the seven churches, the seven spirits of God. The fire was originally lit. The very first time was lit by God himself. And he is the fire that lights and illuminates us, that we are tenders of the flame of God. It isn't somebody else's responsibility to tend your flame. It is your responsibility to tend that flame of God. And thus, we continue in our study of the articles, the fashion, the design of the tabernacle. Speaking of us, we are the tabernacle of God, and the Holy of Holies is on the inside of us. God bless you.